South Africa. You'd be able to interact, to network, to share ideas and opportunities well beyond this year's conference. In addition, I do hope you are following at least one of our social media channels. Please share your thoughts and experiences during the next three evenings using the also2020 hashtag. And a huge thank you always has to go out to Linka Puthita, who is our incredible marketing manager. Without her, all these channels would be very quiet. So we are very, very lucky to have her on board. Lishan mentioned our conference sponsors, and yes, we need to thank them because they're absolutely amazing. And really, we wouldn't have been able to do this without them. They've managed, we've been able to provide free registration to all of our attendees this year. The Industrial Engineering Department of Stellenbosch University sponsored the prizes for last night's online pub quiz. And Blue Stallion has once again provided the prize for our two student competition winners who will be announced on Wednesday. Please find a moment to stop by their Discord channels for both Special Edge and Sally's Industrial Engineering Department and find out more about them. We have three keynote speakers through, uh, through this week. So first up next tomorrow night, we have Prof. Hatim Mazri, who is the Dean of the College of Business Administration at the University of Bahrain. He is also the current president of the African Federation of Operations Research Societies. Prof. Mazri will be speaking to us about AFROS and how his new federation will help set up the sustainable development of operations research in Africa. Prof. Tulitsi Mawala, as Vice-Chancellor Vice of the University of Johannesburg, as well as the Deputy Chair of the South African Presidential Commission on the Fourth Industrial Revolution. And he will be speaking to us about artificial intelligence and operations research. Finally, Prof. Pascal van Hittenreik is the Associate Chair for Innovation and Entrepreneurship and the A. Russell Chandler III Chair and Professor of Industrial and Systems Engineering at Georgia Tech. He will be speaking to us on how ICT technology and operations research have the potential to revolutionize public transport and community. So Alicia mentioned this previously, and yes, we are giving away one of Prof Mawala's brand new books, Closing the Gap, and these will be signed by him. So all you need to do is make sure you join every night by attending, we get your email address and we will be doing a lucky draw and deciding on who gets that book each night. The winners will be contacted by email, but we will also be announcing them on Wednesday night during the award ceremony. A massive thank you needs to go out to the organizing committee and David Clark, who has headed, it up, headed this up. Definitely, this would not have been possible without everyone. And they have put in a lot of time and effort, and we need to be thankful for them. We are all very excited about the program that the organizing committee has put together for us. And on behalf of the organizing committee, members, David Clark and myself, I would like to welcome you to the Operations Research Society of South Africa to our 49th annual conference. Lishan, back to you. Awesome, thank you, Gemma. I need to make you the host, don't I? Yes, please. I'm trying to do that now. <laughs> And there, Alicia, and you should have that now. Thank you so much. All right, so on to the first item on our program today, which is a presentation by Dr. Bernd Lindner about the 2019 Tom Rose Rudowski winning paper. So for those who haven't grown up in the society and are visitors here and don't know how our award system works, the Tom Rose Rudowski Medal is the society's premier award and it has been awarded on an almost annual basis since 1971. And the medal is awarded to the best written contribution in operations research by a member of the society of the previous year. So we barely ever revisit the amazing work that these medal winners do. So we took uh, the liberty this year to fill the program and just revisit last year's winning paper. The winning paper is by four authors. You can find all of their details and their um, emails on our detailed program on the conference website. And it is on the trade-offs between leveling the reserve margin and minimizing production costs and generator maintenance scheduling for regulated power systems. And the presenter will be the first author on the paper, Dr. Lindner. And yeah, thank you. We're excited to hear from you, Bernie. 
Okay, thanks, Lishan. You can just make me the host. Okay, hello, everybody. Um, just I'll put my video on in the beginning of the presentation so you can see how I look. Uh, but when I start presenting, I'll just turn it off just to minimize the bandwidth. So what I want to do now is just test if you can see my screen. I'm just going to start sharing my screen. Okay. Um, DC, can you uh, maybe just check if it's in full screen mode? Or yes, Gemma, looks or? great. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, let me just turn my video off. How do I uh, need to look to get my video off? Give me two seconds. Get my video off. Oh, there. Sorry. Okay, great. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you for attending. So, I will just be giving you an overview of the paper that I submitted, I think, in 2018 with uh, some of my esteemed colleagues. So, uh, this is actually my name I'm presenting. This was my colleague who did a master's project under Prof. Becker here at the Industrial Engineering Department, and my work was a PhD with Professor Jan van Vieren. And um, I was, uh, as you can see, I was at industrial engineering at Stellenbosch University and specifically the Stellenbosch unit for operations research and engineering. Okay, so maybe just to give you an overview, this is the paper, so you can find the link there. It was submitted to the International Journal of Electrical Power and Energy Systems, uh, submitted on October 2018. It did ne definitely not get submitted September 2018. It took quite a lot of revisions, so maybe just a bit of, uh, uh, encouragement, just keep uh, working on those revisions from the reviewers. <laughs> uh, it's not nice in the beginning, but uh, it's worth it in the end. And um, interestingly, I ca actually came and visited it. Uh, there are a few people that are citing it. That's the paper. Okay, so maybe just before I get into the paper and the results and the case study that I did, I just want to put into a high level what, what's the importance of the work that, that we did. So um, this is just an excerpt from ESCOM's website. I'm going to start my stopwatch here. I'll carry on. Great. So, uh, as you can see, yeah, they mentioned we are implementing appropriate levels of planned maintenance in line with the generator sustainability strategy. And this has resulted in a reduction of the number of plant breakdowns over the past seven months, positively impacting plant availability. So, we all know the importance of maintenance, and we will, are looking in our paper at planned maintenance for generating units of a power system. So just an overview of my presentation, I'll just introduce the concepts, uh, especially the generator maintenance scheduling problem. This is a well-known academic problem. Then our proposed buy objectives, as well as the simulated annealing algorithm used to find the Pareto fronts, and then specifically the 32 unit um, IEEE case study that we implemented this fall, as well as the objective and decision space from those results. And we also looked at relaxing some of the constraints and how that influences the objective space and I will just conclude at the end. Right, so the generator maintenance scheduling problem is basically at a power station you have uh, a couple of uh, generating units depending on the size and the type of power stations. So this is for example the Letabo station in the Free State. There are six 618 megawatt installed capacity units totaling 3708 power for the power station. So basically you want to schedule the planned maintenance outages for the generating units to satisfy demand effectively and efficiently. That can be summarized. Now the problem is you don't just need to uh, solve the problem for this station or just one unit. You typically are, have a system where there's multiple generating units over multiple stations. So this is just an example. So that one is just sitting there. You can see in South Africa, we have a lot of coal power stations in Mpumalanga, you know, and uh, we have a nuclear power station. So all the different power stations. So, the idea is you have to schedule maintenance for all of these units, you know, in a planning period. So if you take that uh, example before, this is actually an optimal solution found for the maintenance schedule. So the x-axis is the days, so, you know, 365 days in the future, the planning period, over the number of units on the y-axis. And the blue Gantt chart represents when maintenance occurs. So this is the duration of maintenance. And um, not everybody can speak here, but usually I always ask, uh, you can get five points or a chocolate. If you can guess why there was not a lot of maintenance done uh, in this period. 
And naturally that is because the demand is quite high. This is winter in South Africa. So the demand is quite high, so you don't do a lot of maintenance during that high peak demand for electricity. Okay, so we're actually gonna now move away and move to the case study, the benchmark system that we used. Um, so in academics, you usually have nice benchmark systems and you wanna prove your value of your algorithm there. So this was actually also a base solution found. Uh, the reason I've changed to green is you'll see a bit later. Uh, but yeah, they are 32 units and it's over 52 weeks. So that's why you get the seven and 21. So, so the resolution is like uh, weekly, uh, how, when to do maintenance. And you can see there's six hydro units of 60 megawatts and uh, yes, two nuclear power stations, uh, two units at 400 megawatts. So that's the idea. So this is actually also a solution found by my esteemed colleagues as well. Okay, so typically, so how do we measure if this is a good solution, right? And also maybe, uh, you know, some people might be saying, well, it's quite small. Why don't we just, uh, just run all the, you know, possible combinations. And as we know, as uh, combinatorial problems just explode as we get much larger. So it's much, it's almost difficult to do a brute force or more importantly, you do not have the time to do that. So what, how do we evaluate if this is a good solution? So in this case, this was actually evaluated based on one of the objectives that I'll explain now. So typically in the GMS problem, there are a few objective functions, things that you want to maximize and minimize. Or think about it as KPIs. So typically this would be economic criteria. So you want to minimize production costs or maintenance costs or unit startup or failure costs. And interestingly, uh, for more deregulated systems, you want to maximize profit instead. So usually in regulated systems, they're a bit more worried about cost, but deregulated systems like in the States, and South America, they have multiple independent uh, producers or uh, different entities, um, and they are just sold there to maximize their profit. Uh, interestingly, you also want to make sure you have enough uh, reliable energy available. So it basically can be split into stochastic or deterministic. So stochastic measures would be loss of load probability and the expected unserved energy. And this kind of takes into account what's the, you know, the predicted demand and the predicted failure. So what's the expected loss of load probability or the expected unserved energy. And usually also another important objective and probably the most dominant one is the deterministic where you levelize the reserves. There's a spelling mistake there, I did notice it. <laughs> and uh, we also wanna maximize the minimum reserves, which I'll explain a bit later. You also could have other objectives, which is convenience criteria. So is the schedule, you know, does it fit well for whatever the plan is have, you know, or how many disruptions will the schedule uh, cause in our system. So you could say you want to minimize the, the these soft constraints. And then you have a few hard and soft constraints. So typically you want to satisfy demand, meaning you do want um, the capacity to be greater than demand plus a safety margin. And then also, um, yeah, you also want uh, your resources available. Um, you want to have at least um, a certain amount of maintenance group. Um, just want to check everybody is everything's all right. You can hear me. It's quite <laughs> disturbing to be so quiet. Yes. Great. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Great. Um, um, then the other one is like you want a maintenance window. So you have the earliest and later starting time. And also, you know, another constraint would be when we say, you know, maintenance has to occur for seven days or 50 days. Is that consecutive days or can you uh, sparse that over the, the planning period? Usually it's consecutive days, as well as um, exclusion um, units. Uh, so some units can't be in maintenance with another unit. So a good example would be the two nuclear power stations of two nuclear uh, units. You know, you can only have one of the units out for maintenance. That would be a good example. And as well, you might have transmission or network constraints. So you don't just uh, satisfy the, the global demand, but you need to satisfy geographic demand in that where the station is close to a certain area. And typically the planning periods are anything from eight weeks to five years, um, usually about a year is a uh, typical problems. And also the time sequences are anything from one day to one month. So that's kind of the resolution of the problem. So, you know, do, can you do maintenance for six days or is it like it's set at weeks? Um, and usually it's, it's usually weeks, so we say one or two weeks. Um, typ typical techniques used to solve the problem, um, to solve these problems would be uh, in a range of uh, techniques. And usually they are mathematical programming techniques or meteoristics um, with the genetic algorithm and simulated meaning being the predominantly, but also mathematical programming and uh, also dynamic programming. Um, those are kind of the two main 
uh, techniques used. But there are other examples in industry where they use fuzzy set theory and expert systems and heuristics. And also, interestingly, uh, this is for maybe for Rob more, uh, what's quite cool these days is uh, something called constraint programming. And uh, it's, they've actually started uh, utilizing that a bit more also to the generator maintenance scheduling problem. Typically, because it's quite a highly constrained problem and you have nonlinear objectives and constraints. So that also works pretty well. So I haven't added that yet. Okay, so um, yeah, so basically, what separate, why did we do our research? You know, what was the point? Uh, most uh, GMS problems are single objective or they have the less dominant criteria as a constraint. Um, uh, there has been some simple multi objective attempt, attempts. So you take the objectives and you solve them separately. Uh, you could do a weighted sum of the objectives. Uh, you, they've also done, sorry, you can, they've actually done this. So this is uh, academic articles. They've done something where they try to get as close to some ideal point or value, or you could use goal programming to handle the multi-objective attempts. But um, interestingly, we, when I submit, so you can see how long it takes to submit a paper. <laughs> uh, my PhD was about 2016. So when we did my research, we found only two 2014 papers and uh, I was so glad that this was confirmed by a 2015 review paper on GMS problems, um, uh, that there were only two uh, papers actually where they did proper Pareto-based multi-objective optimization. And um, they were actually similar co-authors, so I think it's like a, a group of uh, office together or colleagues. Um, and they actually did a quite sophisticated system where they looked at a deregulated system that had three power producers and about five to six objective functions. Um, this was some global sort, uh, global search, sorry, on the producers, this um, heuristic, but they also applied a, a non-sorted genetic algorithm, a non-dominated sorting genetic algorithm, sorry. Um, and maybe what's important is like, we, what, is, what are we doing that's different, you know, like, and well, what, what, what they did is they did have a sophisticated production cost, a non-linear, but they didn't solve the production cost by a sophisticated system as we have done. They kind of said, well, just randomly choose how much is produced at this power station between the minimum and maximum, right? And we've actually done a linear programming to solve that and estimate what the fuel cost would be. So that's kind of where, you know, you know that's, I don't know if you've ever seen those graphs for like PhD and stuff, but that's a little dent. Uh, in the, the GMS problem. Yeah, okay, so let's get into it. The first um, objective that we, will, we, we attempted to solve was the, the most common one, which is um, trying to satisfy reliability. And this is commonly called the sum of squared reserve. So you take the available capacity minus the demand and you square it. So, you know, I'm taking, I'm using again, this is the case study that I've been showing the whole time, that 32 units. If uh, on the, you know, the x-axis, we have the number of days, 365, and the megawatts on the y-axis, this red represents the demand. So, you know, you can say predicted demand plus some safety margin, 15%. And uh, this green line would be the installed capacity, uh, the available capacity. So it's kind of what's the system's installed capacity minus maintenance. So, you know, that Gantt chart that I was showing you before, it had a lot of maintenance occurring here, so that's why the available capacity is less. And what you want is you want this band to be quite even, right? You want to levelize this. You want this reserves to be quite even across the spread. And one way to do that is to take the available capacity minus the demand and you square it. It's kind of similar in stats where you, you know, want to get fit on the line, you know, the R, that, that value. So yeah, so that's the idea. So that's one good way to levelize the reserves. And also the squaring helps with um, penalization. So the further away you are, the more you get penalized, the further the, the band is. You kind of want to make it level across the planning field. And importantly, um, you have to do maintenance, you know? So that's what this objective function kind of assumes. You have to do maintenance. Uh, you can't say, I'm not going to do maintenance. So that's why you have to, there's going to be a drop and it has to kind of follow the demand. Okay, so maybe also just to give you a, a bit more overview of what the problem looks like. So yeah, is the case study or the, the, that we tried to solve. So yeah, is 32 units. Um, and the, you can see the different colors of the different stations. So this first six are the hydro power stations. This is a nuclear power stations and coal power stations all the way to the gas turbines, right? And uh, what we have is the installed capacity. We also have what the earliest and latest starting time is. So you can see one to 52, that just means they can have maintenance occur throughout the whole period. And how long does maintenance have to be? It has to be two weeks. 
And this manpower required is like how much uh, the, the crew is needed for those days. So the first week you need six and the second week you need another six uh, manpower or crew. And you can see it kind of differs based on, so there's a six weeks of maintenance. First week you need 15 and drops to 10 and then goes down to five. Uh, this is the exclusion set. So this just basically means in this set of set six, okay, uh, only three units are allowed to be out on maintenance. And also what we have is, so maybe I'm just going to explain, we use uh, the fuel cost to, to estimate the production cost because this is by far the most uh, dominant cost when, when talking about production costs as a fuel cost. So, you know, in, in this case, the, we estimate the fuel cost to be zero for the hydro, you know, because the, technically the, the, the water is kind of free, but there's obviously costs with unit startup and maintenance, but we do not take that into consideration. The other thing that's quite of interest is this utilization factor, kind of meaning after your availability, you can like go uh, from zero to 100% for the hydro units. And uh, so yeah, as a nuclear power station, so you can see yeah, the first unit, this unit is in the beginning of the year and this one's in the second part of the year. And that's why you don't need an exclusion constraint here because you satisfy that by having these earliest and latest time speeds. And you can kind of see, I've sorted it here, the by cheapest to most expensive, your nuclear is the cheapest based on the heat rate and the fuel costs. So you just times those two to get the cost rate, so dollar per megawatt hour. And you can see the gas turbine is kind of the most expensive. And this energy utilization factor is kind of what I was mentioning. Gas turbines have a lot more flexibility. You can go down to you know, only producing a 4% of the capacity, but coal and oil needs to be, you can't run it at very little. It has to be running at a certain uh, level. So it's a 60 to 100%, you have to run that. Okay. So, um, I might, uh, some people are quite interested a bit in the math. So, you know, this uh, reliable, so this is actually the same, uh, the, uh, my colleagues actually submitted to the same paper uh, in 2013 and the same use case. So we kind of just depending on to that with the fuel and production costs. But the first objective is to minimize the summer squared reserves. And so this, uh, I try to fit everything on one screen. This is such that that's what the reserves are. And we have this uh, Y decision, uh, auxiliary decision variable, which is, if maintenance is done in for unit I in time period J, okay, that's a one or zero. So you have your installed capacity minus if maintenance were done. And as you can see, J is your time period, right? So you try to minimize that. And uh, I wanted to do, have these pop up as bullets, but LaTeX was not my friend. So just try to stick with me. <laughs> uh, so we try to keep a uh, demand. So your reserves must be equal to the demand plus a safety margin, right? And uh, you also need an earliest. So the second one is specifying the earliest and latest time windows. So XIJ is if uh, that's our that's actually our decision variables. These are our auxiliary decision variables to figure that out. So that um, needs to be this is the if unit I in time period J starts uh, maintenance, and then that is set over the duration. So that's why you populate kind of this YIJ, which is the auxiliary decision variables, and this constraint is just to link that. Um, maybe not worry too much. And what you can also do is you need to formulate it so that you can work out the main uh, required uh, required uh, manpower. So this should actually be manpower. So that, uh, you know, over each period you have so much manpower required. So that's what that M means there. So you times that. And this is also just to handle the exclusion constraints. And basically, our decision variables are binary in this case. Okay. So. Um, Quite importantly now, this is where we try to add a bit of more value. So let's say, do we think that just, you know, maximizing or minimizing that first objective, how will that influence the production cost? So I wanna explain that a bit, yeah. Let's say we zoom in on this area. So this is a maintenance schedule. We've got the available capacity. Let's say we just zoom in in here and this is the loads for that day, right? Um, and you can see it goes down a bit. And let's say these are your power stations uh, sorted from, you know, cheapest to most expensive. So you'll have your hydro and nuclear power stations at the bottom here. And let's say what you would expect is um, that you try to fill up the load as much with your cheapest uh, power stations, right, based on available capacity. But let's say, for example, yeah, on this day, one out of the two nuclear units were taken out. That means you have 50% capacity, so you can only produce that much uh, for that day, right? And that will have like kind of a knock-on effect. And let's say, for example, these are your gas turbines at the top here. That means that they have to produce a bit more, and that would affect the the, the costs, right? So that's how we envisage that the production cost would change based on the maintenance schedule. 
And so there's actually two problems being solved here. This is actually a well-known problem, kind of like the GMS, which is the unit commitment and then a subsequent economic dispatch problem. So how, they, how we uh, formulate it and how they do it mostly in industry is they have a unit commitment, which just means you take all these guys. So maybe there's, there's 30 uh, power stations in this example. And um, you rank them by cheapest to most expensive and you say what the installed capacity is. And if they match the demand, um, then you just say those units are committed, right? And there are a bit of costs for unit and startup costs that you can formulate that we did not take that into consideration, but that's a good way just to state. And then those units that are committed, you need to find what is their optimal, what is the best way, how much to produce. And that is solved in the economic dispatch problem, which would be formulated as a linear programming problem. Right, so maybe just to explain a bit more, um, we, this is where we add a bit of novelty. We used a production planning module uh, from my colleague's master's project and we uh, to estimate the production cost associated with an energy generation plan. Uh, we used a linear programming model to solve the economic dispatch problem, uh, which is preceded by a simple unit commitment algorithm. So at its core, so in this case where we had the nine power stations, you basically have 10 stations. We add one station, which is the dummy unmet, uh, so that you could, you know, you could uh, penalize that quite a lot to say, if you don't meet demand, you have this dummy station which has a high cost and you have two time slices per day so that's off peak and peak we, we, we sum up the demand megawatts per hours for that off peak and peak and let's say over 365 days that's your uh, decision variables now importantly we just use this decision variables these aren't actually the decision variables in the maintenance schedule those graphs the GAN charts I showed you it's just we need to solve this LP to figure out okay they want to do the cheapest uh, production uh, so we solve that and then we get that and use that as one value for the whole year. And then we know for a maintenance schedule, what's the production cost. So basically how it works is there's some parameters prior to the LP. You sort the 24 hour loads into two time slices, peak and off peak. And we have something called the energy availability factor. And basically what that is, that is 100% minus planned capability loss factors. So this is actually planned maintenance uh, minus, you know, uh, minus, unplanned capability loss factors. So that would be breakdowns, unplanned, you know, something went wrong and other capability loss factors. And uh, a good example of other capability loss factors is maybe strikes or something happened at the station that wasn't, you know, planned or unplanned uh, breakdowns or uh, loss factors. And interestingly, this is how the maintenance schedule uh, interacts with the, this production planning module. It basically spits out a maintenance schedule, calculates the sum of squared reserves, and then feeds that into here, uh, affects the plan capability loss factors, and then we solve the linear programming problem for the production and we get a production cost. Uh, it also takes into account that minimum and maximum utilization factors, you know, that like gas turbine can go from four to 100%, whereas coal can go from 60 to 100%. Also the unit commitment problem, which is just that merit order that I explained a bit. And it also takes into account hydro units, um, this case study that we solved doesn't have any pump storage schemes, but the, the paper, the master's project by uh, Reino Brits actually caters also for pump storage schemes, uh, which is pumping, you know, water from off peak, uh, higher up, back up, and then being that being used for peak period. So to just get yourself a bit more capacity. And uh, interestingly, I used R uh, for all my research. And in this case, we just used LP store package in R to do that. Right, so just to give you an overview again, the objective is to minimize this fuel cost. So we have a cost per station over time period T, you know, so this is not the same as the J thing. This is like a time period, uh, you know, off peak and peak uh, per day. And um, what we have is minimize that and Z is our decision variables here again. So I went X and Y from the previous generator maintenance schedule and made these are decision variables. And um, they must obviously satisfy a certain availability. So if you can kind of think about it, the generator maintenance scheduling problem changes the parameters in this part of the linear programming problem. Yeah. And this, is, this constraint is just to meet the load at time period T. Um, this constraint is just to say the utilization factor, so it must be between a min and a max. So uh, these sets are actually two, three, and four, whereas this set, which is exact utilization, is like um, a hydro, uh, hydro power stations where they have, you know, it's set how much water can go through it, kind of. So they, they usually set that as exactly, but these you can, you know, you have flexibility based on the utilization factor. And we just want to make the problem non-negative. So you make it like that. So it's over 
So S just represents station S over time period T. Okay, so just to, it's quite a lot, but basically how the uh, implementation works is that we generate a, generate a maintenance scheduling problem, uh, or um, sorry, not a, a problem, but a solution. Uh, we determine the availability, you know, and with that we can easily figure out what the first objective is, which is that sum of squared reserves to levelize the, the reserves. Um, and then uh, separate to that, we feed it through to the production planning module, which consists of the unit commitment problem, and then subsequent economic dispatch problem, which is the LP, and that just, you know, the only reason we get those decision variables there for the station is to figure out what the production costs for the whole planning period is. So like it's a year, and basically you get these two objective functions for each generated uh, solution. And naturally the question is, well, what's good? You know, like how do we get to the next one? How do we do it? And that is the whole point of an algorithm. Great. Okay, so we're going to attempt to try some break for questions. Or do you see anybody? I think we, so this is my halfway, so we can maybe take like five minutes of questions if anybody has anything that really doesn't make sense. If you need to wave at Bernie right now and just stop him for, for questions before he carries on, uh, you can just indicate either in the chat or you can raise your hand. And uh, then we can also, um, uh, make your microphone available again if, if you want to do it in voice. So uh, let me just give a second if anybody wants to raise any questions. Bernie, it looks like your audience is riveted, so I don't see. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I have a question. I have a question. Okay, cool. um, I have it in text, so I'm just going to read it in the person stead. Janessa Ignatia says, thank you for the presentation. Please, how did you come up with the graphical representations? Uh, I used uh, the Tux package in LaTeX. I don't know if I would recommend it, uh, but it works quite well once you have a set. So it's just uh, LaTeX, you can do this in LaTeX with the Tux package. Yeah do those graphs and the uh, flow charts as well. Thanks, I don't see any other questions. So I think you can carry on. Okay, cool, okay. Okay, so uh, just a bit of theory again. Um, the, the whole point of multi-objective optimization, so I just want to show you a, a nice example to explain this. It helped me understand the whole uh, field as well. Uh, let's just say you have two objectives, right, that you want to minimize or maximize. So this is just, a, this is nothing to do with the generator maintenance scheduling problem. This is just to illustrate the, abstractly the whole point of multi-objective optimization. Let's say you combine these two objective functions and you weight them, right? You might even scale them, you know, based on uh, that they kind of are in the same ballpark uh, values and you might have weights, but let's say you combine these two and you say, okay, well, I'm just going to minimize this guy, like in normal, you know, kind of what you learned first in operations research, you have one objective function. All right, so let's say we, I just want to show you an example. So let's say the parameters are these, this makes the problem convex. And uh, what we're going to play here is you change the weights and then you get different F values and yeah is F1, function one and function two. And you want to minimize both of these. So you kind of want to get as much as possible to this point, but that's not possible. These are kind of the feasible solutions to get to there. And naturally, uh, that's the whole point with the Pareto front is this solution here is not better than that solution there. It's just based on user's preference. However, a solution in that space is dominated by that solution. So you would not even consider that solution. But uh, if we were to just change the weights and run it, you get, you will be able to get the Pareto front. So, you know, not just solving one instance, but you solve multiple based on the weights. Um, however, if the problem is non-convex, so we just make it these things, there might even be areas on the Pareto front when you're running this that you will not even get to, right? And um, so this is where, you know, there's nothing wrong with combining objectives, I feel. Uh, you can maybe then run the different weights and see it, but just be careful of if your problem is non-convex, you might not even get these solutions. And that's the whole point with the multi-objective optimization is to kind of get these points. So you don't use this technique of weighted sum to find that. So in our case, we use the simulated annealing dominated, uh, dominant based multi-objective optimization. 
So the reason we chose the simulated annealing algorithm, uh, first of all, our problem is uh, nonlinear and very uh, combinatorially hard to solve. So we know why meteoristics can help us with this. And in this case, we just, uh, you, this is quite an elegant uh, multi-objective optimization. So it's, if you guys are used to simulate annealing, this should make sense. It's just how do you translate single objective to multi-objective? So in this case, you know, um, let's just say we have kind of think of this as our true Pareto front on this side. And this is, we've run that algorithm for like, like an hour. And this is kind of what we found is the best solution. And now, you know, simulated annealing is kind of just a smart way to explore the search space. And based on its temperature, it will try to uh, explore. So jump out of a local uh, minimum and try to maybe go to a worse search space, but it might then find another uh, local minimum that might be a, the global minimum. So in this case, uh, let's just say we have, this is the current solution and this is the neighboring solution. Uh, we make this the difference in the objective function. So we're going from the area where we want to be. So this is better than this solution because there's already points here. We want to explore this space and find it. Um, but you know, in simulated annealing, you don't just always go to a better solution. The idea is that you explore the decision space. So in this case, if we take those values, they use, this is an elegant way to do that. You, there's a probability of moving from this current solution to that neighboring solution of 86%. And naturally based on the temperature, which you, you know, you cool, you know, it's your cooling rate, at the end of the search space, you kind of maybe don't want to start going here. You want to start exploring, but right in the beginning, you don't mind jumping around and going to worse. Uh, so in, in quotes, worse uh, areas where there's already a non-dominated front being found. And the other way around, so, you know, in simulator annealing, you always go from uh, a worse to a better solution. So this is your current solution, that's your neighboring solution. Um, the probability of moving, it's quite nice, nice and elegant, it's all the same, is uh, 100%. So you would move there and then explore around this space. Um, there are, so we also, um, you know, for most algorithms, you have to do a bit of uh, like machine learning kind of talk about like uh, hyperparameter tuning, but the algorithm yeah, also has a few parameters. So the few parameters that we looked at was the geometric cooling rate, the reheating rate, so that's affecting that T in the previous graph, and also the initial acceptance ratio. And we also handle the constraints by multiplying it into the objective functions. Uh, so constraint penalty severity. And we looked around, so we looked at um, in academics and these are kind of suggested values, you know, low, from 0.85 to 0.95, in this case 0.5 to 0.95. So we just did a low, medium, and high, and you do a combination of these, right? So we ran two to the power four, 81, so 81 cases to find the best combination of the parameters. And in each combination, um, so obviously stats people would be very upset if I just did one run. Uh, we did 16 runs, we could do more, but uh, just to, you know, because this is a stochastic model, so you might find different, every time you run it, another time you'll find a different result. So we just did 16 and then we calculate the performance on average, which was better. So that kind of resulted in 81 times 60, you know, 1,296 non-dominant fronts. Now, how do you measure, uh, you know, let's say you have a front here and you have a front that's sitting somewhere else. You know, how do you measure in one, in a, it's, you want to get it to a scalar value, whether it's good or not. Uh, there are a few ways to do this, but one common technique is the hyper volume. So basically what you do is, let's say you've got two objectives that you want to minimize, F1 and F2, and you have a reference point, and you work out what that hyper volume is. So naturally, if you had another front here, you know, it's better, that's doing better than that, that hyper volume would be larger. And that's just one way to get it all into a scalar value. Uh, importantly, you must uh, not, uh, you must, the reference point is quite important, so you could like, you know, uh, do this based on the weighting of these F1 and F2. So that was a way that we just did. So we, you know, we ran all these, all of these. So you get like 1,296 H's, hypervolumes, and then you see which of those parameters are good. Uh, the other parameter that we also looked at was the epoch length. So it's a stopping criteria. We did not add it to the, like the combination of the previous four, where it was three to the power four, you would do maybe four to the power four. We just took the medium settings and uh, ran that and just saw what the hypervolume is. So we found the epoch length. So it's, this is to do with the stopping criteria of the algorithm. Um, we found that this was the average hypervolume was 0.92, and this is the standard deviation. So this is a good solution. And then maybe just on the other things that I showed you there, those previous parameters, we found those were the best parameters. And that was uh, when we just reran it, uh, we got this hypervolume. Okay, so so now we've like ran, we've got our algorithm, we've set the parameters that we need to do. So I now threw it 
at the problem and uh, maybe just focus on the top left one. So we've got our two objective functions. We want the minimum sum of squared reserves and the fuel cost. So we want to minimize both. And what I found was so I ran this one for about 24 hours. Just took about 24 hours. There was not much. This this point here is the previous single objective where you just go for minimizing the sum of squared reserves. And as you can see, there's not much trade-off with our new objective added that we would hope was conflicting. The case studies, and I found, you know, there was trade-offs, but um, had a bit of a aha moment and realized that actually in this use case, the reserves is quite high. So you have quite a high installed capacity versus the demand. So if I just made the demand and you add it by that safety margin, you know, uh, like 10%, then you get a bit more of, so naturally your uh, fuel cost is is uh, higher because it's got less leeway to work around and you get uh, uh, different sum of squared reserves as well. And this kind of, you kind of see doing that because in our case, we, you know, this could be unplanned. So you're not, you we've got the demand, but you must think about, well, what if, uh, you know, I have 10% unplanned breakages in the, in the day or the, or the month. And that took about eight hours, and then we took 15% in eight hours. Yeah, we found. So that was the previous single objective there, and this is our new proposed objective. So we've so interesting uh, insight here was that when your reserves are quite high, uh, you know, you've got a high install capacity versus demand, your production cost, this planning module, has a lot of leeway to figure out a, a low production cost. So it's not necessarily uh, that big conflicting objectives. Uh, but when they are quite tight, uh, it's got, it doesn't have much leeway. So it's got to just oh, take this production cost. This is the best I can do. And then that's what you find different trade-offs there. Uh, the other thing that we also did is um, because simulated annealing is a trajectory based. So typically if you haven't, uh, haven't set it another way, you would just run a single thread. So on your machine, just one call. Uh, we were quite interested in, you know, running using parallel computing. So you use all the cores or the CPUs of the machine. And um, we used uh, R's for each and do parallel computing packages, which were quite easy to implement. And basically if we had eight cores, uh, we would just run eight parallel of these searches from eight different starting solutions. So this is actually a, a common thing to do with um, trajectory based materialistics. This is a way just to just, you know, in the same uh, time, eight hours, you could have done eight runs instead of just one run, right? Um, so that's the idea. So we chose this option where you have multiple independent walks. And um, yeah, so that's what we did here, which also was uh, quite cool to see. So you basically hopefully get a wider spread of the Pareto front, which also works nice for multi-objective optimization because you're starting at different points and you can maybe get a wider spread or push further in. Okay, so um, the objective space. So if we just take now that 15% that I showed you, we take the demand plus 15%. Um, we have the production cost here and that's sum of squared reserves. Now you can see the problem is highly constrained. So all these solutions were usually infeasible. And interestingly, when you got to feasible solutions, they actually did well on like, let's say the sum of squared reserves and the production cost. So that's kind of zooming in here. And uh, the reason that is, is because we have that maintenance crew, which means you only have 25 crew available for, uh, and you would naturally, if you satisfy that demand, you kind of uh, uh, spreading the, the maintenance usually. You're not putting it all onto one day or one week. So that's why kind of those two aren't that much conflicting, you know, the maintenance crew versus the summer squared reserve. So generally, if you are getting feasible solutions for the maintenance crew, you are doing well on the uh, summer squared reserve. That's why you have uh, this, yeah. So again, in multi-objective optimization, this is not a good solution. You could rather choose that solution, but that's not better than that solution. So you're minimizing the fuel cost based on the sum of squared reserves. So you can see there's about a 10% difference in that uh, axis and about 2.4. So it's not as sensitive on the fuel cost uh, generator maintenance scheduling than the sum of squared reserves. And interestingly, the sum of squared reserves, just to do one evaluation, you know, it's just that available capacity minus demand is just to one evaluation takes uh, much faster than, you know, taking that, giving it to the LP solve and get the production cost, which takes about a second. So uh, also interesting insight there. So if we just now look at this, you're going to zoom in and this is our Pareto front. These are the non-dominated solutions. So all of these solutions are kind of quotes optimal uh, in the Pareto sense. 
So he yeah, has that single objective. So if you were just striving for summer square reserves, you would get quite a good fuel cost, but there are solutions where you don't do as well on the summer squared reserves, but you do get uh, less fuel costs. So in this case, I think it's about, about a million uh, times 26. Yeah. Um, then you can also see, yeah, it's not as sensitive on the fuel cost. You only say 0.41, but it is quite high values. And what I want to do now is actually show you the two extremes. So that's that, you know, so remember that first Gantt chart I showed you, which the green, that's that solution there, kind of. And now I'm going to show you how does that solution compare to this one, which is on the other extreme. So let's just take those two examples. And we have the first one, which is our available capacity uh, based on the demand. So, you know, you can see, yeah, the green, which is, doing very well on the summer squared reserves, is kind of following the demand and levelizing much better than the blue. You know, this guy drops here, right? Um, and you can see there, right? So that's 33, uh, to the part, times 33 million megawatt squared versus uh, 35 million megawatt squared, but the fuel cost is uh, better. So he has the fuel costs here. Um, yeah, about a, a million there, great. And then interestingly, what you can see is these graphs kind of chat. Oh, sorry, so this is the megawatt squared. Uh, this is the fuel cost. So interestingly, you can see, look, uh, that statement that I was saying is like, when you have less reserves, you've got less uh, leeway for the production plan to get a good, cheap fuel cost. And that's what happened, yeah, B goes down. Uh, it actually did a nuclear power station uh, unit, yeah. And you can see the fuel cost went up. It had less leeway. Uh, but so it's kind of figuring out where's the best to do it. So it's not doing so well. So just to show you. So you can kind of see when these crisscross, that's kind of when these crisscross the other way. It's quite cool to see. Um, so in that case, just uh, this is now the solution. So A was there. You can see there that nuclear power station was done before that solution. And that's why you have that big drop there. And that's why the fuel cost goes up there. So this thing's maybe figuring out like, oh, there's higher demand. Or yeah, give me more leeway and I can get a better fuel cost. So. Uh, it's not all about just looking at, you know, that it's the nuclear and these cheap guys are have to do with the combinations of the other ones and they have also constraints. So it's kind of figuring out the best way to do that. So you can kind of see that blue there, uh, that one. Remember at the end, the demand is quite high, yeah? Um, and it's going much lower and it's doing lots of maintenance compared to that green solution at the end, yeah? Because uh, it's just, it's figured out that that's what the good production cost is. And these are just installed capacities. Yeah, so that's that was quite cool to see as well. All right, so now uh, what we also did was relaxing some of the constraints. So if we take that same solution, he has a Pareto front that uh, he has that single objective, just minimizing the sum of squared reserves. We take that same front, and now we relax the constraints. So in this case, I relax the maintenance crew, which was you've got a maintenance crew of 25 people over the year. I uh, just relaxed that and said you have infinite maintenance crew and that could be you employ or you uh, contract some guys in or something. And you can see naturally uh, you're getting better on the Pareto front, you're finding better solutions. Uh, more so on the fuel cost than the sum of squared reserves. And again, that's the whole point, right? This, the, the sum of squared reserves doesn't have much conflicting object, uh, conflict with the maintenance crew because naturally when you spread out your maintenance crew, make sure that you don't go over it, it means you've actually probably levelized the maintenance over the period. So just to show you that as an example, so let's say that's a maintenance crew of 25, that's the original solution and feasible. If we were to go and say we have 40 uh, maintenance crew, we can get a better uh, a fuel cost. And naturally you can see there's more uh, conflict between the maximum crew and the fuel cost, not the sum of squared reserves. So, you can still get very good summer squared reserves with minimum maintenance group because you are spreading kind of the maintenance over the period as well. So that's what they So you can maybe, you know, you could take this to management and say, well, if you've got 40, you know, you uh, employed about 50 more guys, how much would you save on the fuel cost? And then interestingly, this is actually the reason why the fuel cost is, can't be changed that or it's not as sensitive. So what I, the other uh, thing that I, we did was we reduced the duration. So let's say, you know, uh, that example I showed you, maintenance takes two weeks. Let's say we said, okay, well, what happens just theoretically if we halve that? So it takes one week. So that's what kind of happening. So that I've shown you all those results. Now we say, okay, let's make the duration a half. So naturally your sum of squared reserves is worse because you have a bigger uh, uh, reserves and capacity. So that you know, the gap between that green line and the, the demand is bigger, but naturally you get, uh, and that's bigger. So that means you get 
can reduce your fuel costs so you can find out better solutions. And then if you do it by, you know, divided by another half, so if it took four weeks, it takes one week, um, and that's what you get there. And then interestingly, this is kind of the, you know, like kind of the lower bound. Let's say there was no maintenance. You said, okay, well, what's the, just the theoretical like uh, value for no maintenance? And that's what that solution is there. Very high someone's credit reserves, but much lower fuel costs. But that difference between there and there is only 7%. So naturally there, you know, that I was showing you, they can only get to 0.41% uh, improvement. Okay, so just to conclude, um, we found that the summer squared reserves works very well. There are sometimes trade-offs with linear production cost, uh, much harder, uh, takes a bit longer to solve. And then interestingly, multi-objective is not always necessary. And uh, what we also concluded in the paper was these results uh, uh, um, justify the reports made in this, in this paper where they said that a, a maintenance schedule for generating units with high reliability tends to incur a low production cost. So generally, if you go down the one objective, you're going to reduce the other objective. And that's what you can kind of see here, right? If you minimize this, you're generally going to get a low production cost. Um, uh, meaning that and there is no not a strong direct conflict between the two objectives in the model of that paper So in their paper they didn't find strong conflict, but that was because they had much larger reserves So they didn't find so uh, Although a schedule and then that's also what they claim a schedule that achieves the highest reliability may not yield the lowest production costs So meaning you can still find a small bit of uh, conflict in that, that area there um, And then what we said was like, you know kind of putting a lower bound you can if you didn't know maintenance the best you can do on fuel cost is a 7.1 percent savings um, and just to maybe drive everything home again and you have to keep pondering this to the to the uh, reviewers and the examiners uh, the novelty was we proposed this uh, bio objective model for the generator maintenance scheduling problem that incorporated quite a sophisticated production planning module uh, that estimates the fuel cost for generation plan. Uh, as, as I said, it's using a linear programming to solve the economic dispatch problem, uh, which is preceded by a simple unit commitment problem. And we also added this fuel cost and, uh, you know, that utilization factor and heat rate. Oh, we actually, the heat rate is there. We just added that to say, this is how you would then estimate the fuel cost. We added that to the benchmark system. And that's also in that same journal. So it's kind of like continuing the research there. And uh, future work. Um, I think it would be quite cool just to do a weighted sum approach and see, you know, maybe uh, you do get a bit of a front or the same, just to see if it is non-convex and convex. I think it is non-convex, but it'd be cool to see. And uh, usually fuel costs are not always linear. So some people have done it. So the heat rate of a power station and stuff is maybe non-linear, um, but that would obviously now make it also long to solve. Um, and then the other thing was uh, the foster, maybe you can improve and make the, the production and fuel cost function faster. So that second, we just maybe can reduce that and that would help. And um, also the startup, include the startup and maintenance and other costs. And that was the future we proposed, as well as taking these other object objectives. So like that convenience, the crew and expected failure. And my uh, colleagues are also working on how, what is the expected failure for the next year based on this generator maintenance schedule. So you can make that maybe another objective and see if there's conflict with these common objectives. Okay, that's me. That's great. Thank you, Bernie. Thank you so much. Um, obviously, we're going to open up for questions now from the attendees. So, um, yes, please just also wave at me or raise your hand or just give me an indication if you'd like to ask your question yourself. Otherwise, um, I'll just read the questions to our speaker. And we have a, a question from an anonymous attendee. So it's very mysterious, Bernie. <laughs> but the question is, looking back on your research, is there anything you would have done differently other than learning more text or regret not having considered? So I'll leave that to you to answer live. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's a tough question. Um, so maybe so i'll maybe give an answer on both so kind of related to the generator maintenance scheduling problem then maybe like personally um so for the one i think um this thing of like looking at the objective functions uh, you know testing the the 
how much conflict there is, and then running that instead of, you know, just saying these are kind of the two dominant, let's run it and see. So there was kind of uh, looking at that, I would have actually liked to have done a bit more other techniques, so maybe constraint programming as well. And um, yeah, so that maybe on that side, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know if anything else. Hindsight's always better, right? And then personally, yeah. Um, yeah, review papers, man. I was very glad to find that review paper. So you kind of want to say and figure out what the landscape is before you start, you know, uh, digging into there and saying, I think this is what needs to change. But uh, that's kind of hard to know because you actually only do that once you start, you know, implementing and doing a little bit of runs and seeing, oh, people have done this before, but they haven't done this. So, yeah, it's very vague. I know I'm not answering there. That's good. Uh, I have a question from Dave Evans, who asks, is yeah. ESCOM aware of these findings and how have they reacted? Yeah, so, which is separate. So I didn't bring a lot of that in because this presentation was focused on the paper, which, you know, just had that uh, benchmark research system. Uh, we actually have done uh, another that ESCOM case study, and we did show a bit of those results. And I think uh, and we also did like a bit of a decision support system. So we did like a shiny application, kind of prove the proof of concept. So there was those discussions and meetings and they like uploaded their CSV files and stuff. Um, and I think that was fine for an MVP and a proof of concept. Um, but I think what would have been nice is if there was a, maybe a bit more collaboration with the industry partner to say, okay, there's this algorithm, but we'll handle how you want to interact and do it because you know, those guys, things change, right? So maybe another good point is, that you must think about is what happens if there's a failure, right? Then you have to run this uh, maintenance schedule all over again because things have changed, right? Your landscape's changed. So you have to run it again. So maybe a bit of uh, flexibility and seeing does that affect the uh, optimal solution again. Um, but I think like a few concepts that they enjoyed was they never thought that, you know, that statement to say, well, should you be doing maintenance, you know, on very cheap units in, quite relatively high demand, you know, you can kind of think that's the thing to do, but you can kind of now visualize it and play around with that. So they, I think that thing, they kind of like that they didn't really think too much about that. And now that's like kind of top of mind. So that was a bit of the interactions with them. Who says, thank you for the talk. Which package did you use to use in R, optimize and find a solution? He just missed the oh. name. Um, so the generator maintenance scheduling, I, that package is not there, uh, that demo. So I coded that myself, um, specifically for combinatorial optimization. So it's not continuous variables. The linear programming was solved by the LP solve package, but the other one I coded it all myself, the dominated base, dominated, the multi-objective optimization, simulator needing that I had to code myself specifically for the, uh, generator maintenance scheduling problem. And Bernie for the most interesting and thorough piece of work. And then there is a, another question from an anonymous attendee. In the scenario where you relax the maintenance crew availability constraint, did you take a cost for the additional crew into account? Uh, no, no, that's kind of the thing, right? You would, you would present that. I don't know what that would be, but you would say, look, you, you can save so much fuel cost. Uh, versus this maintenance crew, and then you would have to see if that's actually worth it. Yeah, but that's that's obviously a good point, right? It doesn't help you save uh, a million rand in four million dollars in fuel cost, but that maintenance crew costs you two million. Yeah, that's a very good point. All right, leave some space. There's uh, we have a couple of minutes more for some more questions. If anybody would like to raise anything, that's Bernie. Uh, Lishan, I have a question. Sorry, I don't seem to be able to raise my hand as a panelist. <clears throat> um, the, when you were submitting for public publication, Bernie, were there, were there any sort of particular review comments that sort of stand out for you? Um, yo, I can't remember, man. Um, yeah. Uh, luckily, my colleagues helped me quite a bit, you know, like my uh, Professor Van Fier and Professor Becker have a bit more, you know, experience. Um, you know, it's kind of hard sometimes with the reviews because you need to decide what, you just need to say, like, do you need to prove the statement? You know, like, 
show results and do it, or you just say, well, you know, to, to the best of our knowledge, that is not applicable yeah, or, you know, kind of have to like just answer the question. So I think you've got to be clear when they ask you questions is, you know, what should you have done versus you, sh uh, that's a valid question, but uh, based on this, uh, that's not applicable. Yeah. So kind of separating those two instead of like, you know, everything that the reviewers ask, uh, are you going to now implement it and double your paper size or something, right? <laughs> so I think the main thing is just to separate those two out. Great, thanks. I have a hand from um, Theo Stewart. So DC, if you can maybe um, just turn on Theo's ability to speak. Are you able uh, to do this? Uh, I think Bernie's the host. I think only he can do it. Oh, um, okay. Just enable to see his mic. How do I do? Do I go to participants? Um, and then go to attendees. Uh, and then okay. Allowed to talk. Okay. Uh, hi, Theo. Theo, your mic is on. Oh, you can just unmute yourself and then you can can raise your question. Hi, are you hearing me now? Yes, yes. yeah. Right, well, <laughs> thanks. It was an interesting overview, so thanks very much. At the beginning, you mentioned NSGA2 and EMO method, which is uh, maybe more widely used than um, simulated the needing. Did you actually ever try that at all? Yeah, so it wasn't in my, in my PhD, I actually used the NSG2 package, because it's in R, just to baseline. And it was performing a bit better. It might be because like I customized my simulated needing a bit more. So I actually did use the NSG2 because there was a really available package in R to do that. Uh, but I, and I performed better than that on the Pareto front, but it could be because I, you know, coded it myself and customized it. So maybe if I spent a bit more time and made the NSGA2 very applicable to my problem, it'll be the same. But I actually did do that in my PhD just for like a bit of uh, sanity or, you know, base checking. Uh, and then just a sort of philosophical comment, really. Um, you weren't sure whether the uh, two objective structure had, uh, had added much. It may have added more than you think, mm. because I, I think the, I think the difference between a, a single objective optimization and by objective optimization is more in just representation than anything else. Mm. You don't need fancy mathematics. You can just look at it. Yeah. And it's at higher level objectives that you can reach other problems. Uh, so okay. you might have actually learned more. <laughs> And you think just by having the bi objective a picture before you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's all. Oh, I can mute myself, I see. Uh, thanks, Theo. Thank you so much, Theo. Uh, I have a question from Sue Merchant. Are there other applications for your work, or is this generator specific? Uh, no, so you can do it for maintenance scheduling. Uh, I don't know what other problems would be that like uh, summer squared reserve. Um, you know, that is kind of a general concept where you just want to make those bands kind of the same. Um, I haven't thought about it, but I mean, in abstract, it's kind of a maintenance uh, a scheduling problem. 
Um, so I think actually people in the audience might know even better on that, <laughs> what would be a cool, a similar application. Okay, are there any other questions? I don't see anything in the Q&A. Right. Last round, last call. Don't want to cut anyone off. I would like to ask a question. Thanks, Jim. Bernie, so I know that in work you have moved on from R to Python primarily. Okay. Would you redo this project in Python or are there aspects you would like to redo in Python? Mm, I don't think it's the same. Look, uh, the one thing with R is the, we had to do like a decision support system. So you could use Shiny. So that makes it quite nice. I know you can like, you know, run Python code as the, kind of the back end. Um, so that question, I mean, that's a big debate, but I mean, uh, the other thing is the people in your office, so maybe this is a bit biased, but if everybody else has knowledge and they're doing it in R, so our office was quite predominantly R, uh, you know, you start off and you just see that. So I wouldn't, you know, the guys, my company uh, kind of have this thing that maybe uh, Python's a bit better for production or, you know, more people are used to it. Uh, but man, I think it doesn't really matter. I think. If you can keep your hands on both, that's good. That's great because both environments have, you know, like uh, Python doesn't have uh, as good shiny uh, packages. There are a few that dash, but it's really not. There's some things that fall short and the other way around. There might be stuff in Python that's not there in R. So I would just keep a, as a data scientist, just keep your ear on both of those uh, languages and see. That's my suggestion. Uh, but going back, no, not really. Uh, for specifically for my work, yeah. Uh, I didn't, there wasn't anything that was like a problem or anything. Cool. In uh, response to Sue's question, Dave says maybe airline airliner maintenance scheduling is maybe an option. Yeah. Look, so my problem is kind of there is set maintenance for a set duration, right? So anything that's kind of like that, right? So you know, I can't you can maybe reduce the duration. So in our case, but usually that's set, that's a parameter. So you would have uh, problems where there's, you know, maintenance has to occur on some component and it has to happen and it's got a set duration. So anything like that would be kind of similar, I think. Awesome. Okay. Um, so, yeah, sorry, I just want to see Gemma's question. We might. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um. So we are going to wrap up here now. Uh, I'm sure you might need a, a leg stretch and a quick bio break before we do the student competition. The student competition starts at half past five, so that gives you a little bit of time to to make small talk in the voice channels and on the Discord. Um, the, we stay in the same room, so you don't need a new Zoom link or you don't need a new passcode. So if you want to stay around, we uh, we will um, put up the splash screen again and, and, and play some lovely background jazz for you to relax to while you get ready for the student competition. But otherwise, we will see you in 15 minutes time. And um, yeah, thank you for attending the session and thank you to our speaker. Thank you so much, Bernie, for your preparation and your time. And then we will see you all at uh, 17.30 for the student competition.